Hello there YouTube, Devin here again. Today, as you can see, I'm in my full Canadian battle dress. No insignia on it or anything. Not affiliated with whatever, just a plain set of battle dress. Uh, of which I've done a video on if you're, you're interested in that type of thing. Uh, but today's video is going to be all about the Brody helmet. Now the Brody helmet has a lot of stuff associated with it that a lot of people really don't seem to understand or don't really get the context of why it was invented. The Brody helmet was invented by a guy named Brody during World War I. Uh, it was designed in 1915 to protect uh, British and Commonwealth soldiers from shrapnel. It wasn't as good as German designs for multiple angles or anything like that, but for when this helmet was designed it was pretty fantastic at its job. Now, as I've said in much of my kind of World War I helmet videos, a lot of the debris that you're having flung at you is coming from the top. Uh, artillery would land and throw huge mounds of dirt and wood, body parts, barbed wire, pieces of metal, rocks, debris of all kinds would be raining down upon you and that's why the helmet was invented. Now the helmet at first in World War I was really really scoffed at because casualties went through the roof when the helmet started being issued and generals were like why are we even issuing this garbage it's totally useless um when in reality those casualties were the number of injuries went up but the number of deaths drastically went down and that wasn't something that till they really looked at the data did they notice was working so these helmets were actually saving lives troops were still getting injured but they were at least living and there was a certain recycling process for those people who were not injured too badly and those who were injured badly would get sent home obviously but at least they got to live the helmet itself was very good at that it has a very as you can see a very wide rim which was used to protect you and now this helmet was worn a number of different ways and a lot of people have asked me questions about the brody helmet in particular as to to why they don't see it worn like how i'm wearing it now how I'm wearing it is very, the brim is very parallel to the ground, and it's, it's totally fine to be worn like this when you're standing perfectly straight. The thing is, most soldiers aren't standing perfectly upright like I am on the battlefield because there's a war going on. There's the so-called storm of steel all around you, and the best way to avoid getting hit by that storm of steel, which includes bullets, shrapnel, and any number of other things, was to be low to the ground. Now, wearing your helmet like this, perfectly parallel to the ground, wearing your Brody, wasn't good for that. And the way the Brody is designed, it gives you a bit of flexibility to use the helmet how you see fit for the situation you're currently in. Now, the Brody helmet has this available to it that the Germans really didn't. Now, the German style helm, while being very good, offered lots of coverage and everything like that, but it wasn't as versatile as the Brody is. So I'm going to argue the Brody's better in some regards allowing that versatility. Because for one, you, you are not impairing your hearing or vision at all. Uh, whereas the Stahlhelm does that, albeit just a little bit, um, sacrifices that vision, that field of vision, and that ability to hear perfectly for protection, which the Germans thought was a worthy trade-off. And considering most helmets have used a... Um, a design of that shape throughout history and most countries still issue a helmet that has that shape albeit cut down a little bit or have previously used that helmet shape it obviously was the better design in the end but the Brody helmet allowed you to do some things that you technically couldn't do with a stealth helm now for one laying down with the stealth helm really sucked because the helmet would bite into your neck and it would rock forward and obscure your vision while you were looking down your rifle sights which was a bit of a problem. Now, another thing the helmet would do is, especially like we said with that storm of steel, bomb goes off next to you. Your natural instinct is to get down, okay? And that could cause the helmet to roll off your head. It could expose your neck when you roll down, which is bad, because um, your neck is very, it's like the Achilles heel of the body. Um, you, anything happens to your spine, you could, potentially get severe damage. Your your neck and throat is by far the most vulnerable part of the human body. 
And the Brody helmet has this really cool way of protecting it. Now, if you've ever seen a lot of historical pieces, you'll see a lot of helmets with their, a lot of soldiers with their helmets like this, tipped way back. And that has a reason. It's not just because, well, some of it could have just been they're being goofy or whatnot. But it has a dual purpose, actually, a really effective purpose. Now, if I turn to my side here and you see, like, an explosion goes off next to me and I get down, the helmet is now covering the back of my neck because it is tipped like that. It is protecting the back of my neck from debris that is falling upon me, which is something you really couldn't do with the Stahlhelm. The Stahlhelm was just designed to cover that at all times, but it would bite into your neck unlike the Brody helmet does. So the Brody helmet has this configurability to where you could do that. Another thing that the Brody helmet was really good at is let's say you are a sniper and you need a helmet to keep yourself safe, but you have a scope. It's very hard to shoot with a scope with most helmets because the, the brim gets in the way. And so you'll see a lot of soldiers, especially if you're right eye dominant and right handed, which most military rifles are configured so that you could really only shoot right handed anyways. You see a lot of soldiers do this where it'll be cocked to one side to allow you to use your rifle sights more effectively with your dominant eye while still protecting your head. Uh, once again, this isn't something you could do with the Stahlhelm, but you can with the Brody. And you see this in a lot of pictures as well. You can see it, co you see it cocked all kinds of different ways depending on the situation because the Brody helmet allows you to do that because it has such a high rim. It doesn't affect your vision or impair your hearing or anything, and it can be configured for any type of scenario. Now, ultimately, in hindsight, this didn't prove to be a very good design during World War II, but giving the Allies the benefit of the doubt, the British and the Americans and everybody who went into World War II with a helmet of this design, it was a very effective design for World War I, and who was to say that before World War II happened that it wasn't just going to turn into another World War I? which is actually what a lot of countries thought it would be. They thought once it finally kicked off that it would turn into more of a World War I style battle. Everyone would get bogged down, the trenches would get dug again, and this design would have been perfectly effective for that. But it turned out it wasn't in the mobile warfare because you needed, uh, emplacements weren't being dug and stuff like that. There wasn't any trenches for cover really. Most soldiers were pretty openly exposed for most of the war. And this helmet offers a lot of exposure, as you can see, most of my head is showing, whereas the Stahlhelm did not have that. It offered more protection, which is why in 1943, the British and Canadians decided to adopt this, the Mark III turtle helmet, okay, which has a different design. It's a, it's deeper, I'm going to take this off to show you the comparison. It is deeper and it offered, see, more, more coverage and more protection than the Brody helmet, which still offering a lot of the same benefits, allowing you to cock it forward or backward to protect your neck while still avoiding that bite, but increasing coverage overall. And this served well into the 80s with a lot of, with a lot of militaries. So, but we're talking about the Brody today. So now, the Brody was initially designed to be a World War I trench warfare helmet. Now, they were made out of magnetic steel, a kind of mild steel, and it proved to be kind of mixed results. They were prone to rust. The liners uh, tended to be junked out of them very easily, made out of wool and oil cloth and leather. It was all held in place with one rivet and it ended up being kind of an issue because if the, the soldier had no way to repair his helmet, nobody really did in the field. They had to be sent back to the factory to be reconfigured. So a lot of helmets, uh, both the Americans, they went to kind of a different route with their Brody helmet than the British. The British drop put a liner in it, replaced the top rivet with a screw so that the liner could be part of the logistic system and removed if the shell was still good and allowed the soldier to keep doing it. It also allowed them, unlike the Germans, to make one shell and have a liner that was size configurable. So the liner was adjustable and came in a variety of different sizes, but the helmet would always remain the same size. So they also later added this elastic chin strap for added give in the helmet, which allows you to have the chin strap tight so you don't lose your helmet swinging around, okay? But it would 
also have the dual effect if you did get take a sharp blow to the head or your helmet caught on something it's not putting undue pressure on your neck because it has give as you can see here just i have it adjusted comfortably it's it's tight so it won't fall off as you just saw me shaking around but i have that much play i could lift it entirely about an, an inch or about 25 millimeters off the top of my head it has that much give into it which is a good thing to have in a helmet because if your helmet liner is too close to the shell or your helmet doesn't have enough give, you can get a lot more trauma into your head from the outside of the shell uh, given an impact. So, um, Another thing about the Mark II helmet from the Mark I helmets is um, something I'll show you in another video. It's about the ability to use a compass with the helmet. Now, a lot of people have seen this as kind of a myth and I'm going to kind of dispel it here as far as helmet collecting goes. So we'll leave that for another video, but hopefully you guys enjoyed this kind of visual history of the Brody and how it would be used and configured and stuff like that. And hopefully this gives you a good grasp of why the soldiers in pictures are wearing it the way they are and what it was designed to do. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.